Hello, this is Decimus Claudius, and I'm welcoming you today to uh, Nova Roma's Twitch stream. Uh, I play this Claudius Flavius Constantinus Aeneas Stilico. He's a senator, legatus pro praetoria of the late Roman of Provincia Germania. And today is a special stream because the uh, the conventus of Nova Roma is still going on. Today is uh, the so um, in the name of the Luni for Floralis and also the conventus, uh, I welcome you all at home uh, today. Well, thank you so much um, for joining me, and um, I'm really glad that we could speak because. Uh, um, I've been following you on Facebook for a couple of years now, and it's always been very fascinating to see your journey. Well, thank you very much. And um, first of all, also hello to anybody that may be listening in here from Nova Roma. Hello from, uh, well, I'm, I'm here on the Danube Limes um, between the two castra of uh, Comagenis and Vindobona. And um, yeah, just returned from Aquincum from the Conventus with a great time there. So looking forward to talk a little bit about that as well. Absolutely. So let's uh, start with the Conventus. Um, I know that in Nova Roma, it doesn't happen that frequently. I believe this is the eighth time in 25 years. So it was a, a pretty big gathering with a lot of people from various countries. Um, in Hungary, so obviously the Hungarians were pretty um, strong in terms of the the members. Um, so, what were your what was your impressions, and also what did you do each day? Well, um, there's a few things I, I I want to pick up upon because I think they are quite important and show something that's very important to me personally within Nova Roma uh, pretty neatly. Um, so first of all, we had great times. I was already there uh, with my girlfriend, actually, um, just uh, the, during the week. It was a coincidence. It wasn't really that we went there for the Conventus, but um, it so turned out that the Conventus had already started a few days earlier than what I thought initially. And so we could uh, assist in the opening ceremony, which we held in front of the National Museum in Budapest, which is held in the style of a uh, Greco-Roman templum, of course. So it was great. Um, and afterwards, a visit of the museum as well with absolutely fantastic uh, Roman uh, artifacts being displayed there. A big silver hoard from the 4th century from my area of interest. So that was great. And then, of course, uh, we, re we returned to Aquincum um, just for the weekend for the festival, the Floralia. It was quite rainy. So... Um, it could have been a bit um, more visitors, I think. But uh, despite the rain, we had really a lot of fun and great times and everything. I hope also that uh, Edilis Lentulus uh, was looking forward to as the main organizer of the Conventus here um, actually materialized and happened. So I think we all had a, a good time. I mean, it's a bummer about the rain. I saw some pictures, but it mm -hmm. looked a lot of fun, especially that um, it was also um, taking place during also a, a festival f just for the general public. And um, so a lot of a lot of just general public people, you know, came by and there were specific events. Um, just for casual visitors. Um, did you have some interactions, not only uh, obviously with the Nova Romans, but just with the general public and perhaps took the lead in some sort of events specifically? Well, yeah, here's, here's a good segue to the next point I wanted to, to maybe talk about. So yes, of course, it all happened during the Floralia Festival uh, of the Museum of Aquincum, which is primarily a living history and reenactment event where living history uh, displays are, are the main focus. And Nova Roma is basically within this festival kind of seen, or at least the audience, the general audience will not be able to make a difference between the 
average reenactment groups and entertainers also that are there. There is no physical, visible difference uh, between that. So it's it's a couple of points now that I've already said I wanted to talk about, which, which are very neat to illustrate um, concerning the relationship between living history reenactment and what Nova Roma does and what Nova Roma is. Because it's, frankly speaking, quite a complicated relationship for many people. It's not when you hear such proficient uh, orators like Lentulus, for example, uh, speak about the nature of it all, as he has really sourced it out on a deeper level. But um, for the average visitor or reenactor, it's quite complicated what Nova Roma is and why it is very present in living history and reenactment, but is not just living history and reenactment. So one of the things that's often been no place in terms of Nova Roma. So the wider province of Pannonia is uh, possible. Now that might be a, a, a bias because I live here as well. I live actually in Noricum, but I'm just on the border to Pannonia and mostly when I do it in Pannonia. Funny thing to mention is there was a lot of Nova Romans at Aquincum, at the Conventus, but I think an equal amount of new Nova Romans sprung into existence after or during this Conventus, as most of my legion joined as citizens. First of all, the, the Quarta de Chimani, my Renekma legion, were just an affiliated legion, uh, mainly to the work of Lentulus. Uh, most of them decided to join and, and see the good. But that's a general dynamic. We see that a lot of people that join now are reenactors, are people the dedication of its material culture rather than its spiritual nature or its language. So we have a really big influx of people that, that do like Roma, do live it by replicating its material culture and modes of life from Republican to the dominant eras. And I think because we have Carnuntum as one, one museum with reconstructed buildings and also Aquincum with some reconstructed buildings in, in close proximity on the Danube, and we have a set of a critical number of very active people, such as myself or as Lentulus, for example, and all the others around him and myself, um, this critical number just gathers more and more traction, more and more people. Since there's such a, a good um, infrastructure in place, um, geographical proximity, the history is very well alive, and we have this UNESCO World Heritage status on the Danube Limes now. And because there's a few really active and professional people involved, um, it just grows very rapidly and gathers a lot of momentum and gravity. So as the more gravity Nova Roma gathers here in Central Europe, and especially in Pannonia, uh, the more Pannonia will be in the forefront and a center. And that's mostly around Aquincum or, or Carnuntum that this happens. So I think that's the, the main explanation of why um, the Hungarians, for example, or the Austrians or the Slovaks or the Czech, for that matter, are so present and visible now in Nova Roma because of that interconnection with real life applications, with the real world, with reenactment, with things you can touch, see, and, and uh, do not have to explain. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely a hardcore part of Nova Roma that are reenactors and they go to many different events. Uh, unfortunately, um, that's not been my experience personally, just because uh, the um, there's not really much of a scene in my area, to, to put it, uh, you know, broadly speaking. But um, I I did purchase a toga and a tunic last year, so hopefully I will be able to be joining in some events in the future. I mean, I'm very bummed out about not being able to go to this conventus just because I was in a in a very difficult um, trip through Turkey the just the week before or less than a week before um, mm -hmm. to go to a lot of Roman places. And, uh, but <laughs> that's a different story altogether. Um, so I'm wondering 
when you were in um, Budapest, were you speaking to others in, in German, perhaps in, in Latin or even in Hungarian or so how did that go? Well, it's a, it's a funny, it's a good question. My first name, uh, my macronational first name, my real first name is Geza, which is a Hungarian uh, first name, of course. Um, but I don't speak any Hungarian. I think the last person in my family that spoke Hungarian was my great grandmother. And, um, that was still in, in Austro-Hungarian imperial times. So uh, many Hungarians are misled when they know my first name or they I get introduced to them with my first name are misled to think that I would speak in Hungarian to them. Uh, just to the big surprise that a man called Geza, which is an archetypal Hungarian name, um, does not know a word of Hungarian. So unfortunately, the only thing I can say is thank you. Köszönöm, and that's uh, that's it um otherwise mostly english of course because my own legion is comprised uh, of various pannonians uh, that speak mostly slovak um so english is mostly our language of um, communication of course in budapest you would find many people that would speak german as well um either because they just are on a visit uh, from austria or from from germany or because they work in austria or germany there's still a, a big cultural connection of course this by the years of the Iron Curtain. And um, yeah, you hear all sorts of languages. So it feels quite Roman in that sense because you hear Slovak, you hear Hungarian, you hear Ukrainian, you hear Polish, you hear Austrian, uh, German, 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 um, English, French. So it was, it was quite international. Of course, Latin is quite missing, but uh, because we had the big honor of having Hortensia uh, and Tullia Scholastica and Lentulus, all three of them in one place. Uh, I think Latin was alive and well also during the, the conventus. Does it normally happen, for instance, I, um, the various reenactments you go, that people actually do speak in Latin? Because, for instance, I've seen pictures of you in Rome, but I, I presume that even at those events, the Italians just speak in Italian, right? Absolutely. So, um, well, we have to differentiate always the, the, the circles in reenactment that I'm mostly familiar with are, of course, the dominant reenactment circles. And they operate very, very differently. It's a very different scene with a very different character and spirit than the, the principate or the Republican reenactment. And um, maybe we will talk about that a bit later because it has some bearings on Nova Roma as well. It does, in fact, interact quite, quite strongly over the past um, past few years. Um, so in our late antique circles, we do have some, I think, a disproportionate amount of people that are familiar, at least to a degree, with Latin and also with Greek, ancient Greek, because we have a strong uh, leaning towards uh, early Christian uh, reenactment. So regardless of the true um, spiritual beliefs of, of the people, there just is this consensus that we portray Christianity more so than the um, polytheistic side of, of, of late antiquity, um, just because the polytheist side is very well represented uh, mostly with the uh, principate groups and displays, and who, if not us in the dominate, are there to display actually uh, paleo-Christian practice and, and mysticism to a way. So um, Latin is very present in our in our community, maybe not as a lived spoken language, but a, a, an informed, in an informed way. So people would know about grammar, would know about um, about Latin in a, in, a, in a way and use it wherever we can. I myself um, use, uh, I'm quite interested in Latin. I had the chance in school, I was in a French school, in a diplomatic school when, when, I, when I went to school here in Vienna, um, to choose uh, between several third languages. My first language was actually French and German, and uh, third language was uh, English, of course. And the fourth language we could choose between uh, Spanish, Latin, and Arab. And I picked Arab <laughs> at the time. So um, yeah, I didn't learn Latin, unfortunately, and I'm only catching up now. Lentulus is a great help. Uh, he's actually writing, he's my ghostwriter. I'm, I'm writing my speeches in Germanic and uh, he translates it then into Latin, into proper Latin of the fourth century, even provincial Latin, it's his uh, speciality. And so I try to bring to reenactment events more spoken 
Latin correctly pronounced and also with oratoric um, styles. Uh, and uh, so I'm trying to get more people into learning small dialogues, small scenes, like theatrical scenes where we can actually converse in Latin and where somebody's then simultaneously translating into English or German. So we're trying to bring that back in because I think it's an important element um, in that thing. But uh, of course, it's limited. Absolutely. Um, I just want to get to the comments really quick because this is actually a, a live stream and I really enjoy, you know, having participation from the audience. So there's a few uh, Selveta Omnises and um, Ty Tiberius Julius Nerva wrote that he freshly uh, arrived from Aquincum. So I believe you uh, met him this weekend. Absolutely. We shared a few cans of Posca and also some wine and uh, great discussions. Salve. And there's also a message from Flavia Procula saying, that's really interesting about your name. So your native language is German, I assume. So that is absolutely yeah. German and French. So just keep those questions coming. Um, the, the next thing I wanted to ask you about um, is actually the, the trip two years ago, which is the first time I've actually heard about you and saw pictures, or maybe it been two years. It was when you did a very long trek. And um, you were also in a lot of Austrian uh, local newspapers and online. I believe you also had YouTube videos, or at least on Facebook. And um, you got a, a lot of attention for that trip. So I'm wondering, um, what really gave you the motivation um, to do such like a, a long and difficult journey in ancient Roman gear? Well, to be uh, honest, it was um, the sudden death of a friend of the family and um, especially a person very important to my aunt. My aunt, she's an archaeologist and she's probably at the, at the source of my own fascination with antiquity in particular. Um, we're all living in a very nice and big house here. Um, in um, on the outskirts of um, of close to Neuburg on the on the Limes, and uh, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm actually sitting here in in my office, and just a door over there here is the the door to the office of my aunt, and uh, with all the archaeological literature and um, um, the prospection reports uh, stacked up there, and so um, this this man was uh, Professor Hans Jörg Ubel, who is a very well-known and important archaeologist, uh, Roman, especially classical archaeologist uh, here in Austria. And he was her professor and her mentor. And he certainly also sparked uh, interest uh, for archaeology in, in myself. And um, despite the fact that I have not studied archaeology myself, I have been always very close to it. And I'm familiar with, with the concepts in, 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 in methodology in, in, our, in, like in scientific thinking and archaeological thinking especially. And so he died um, that year suddenly. And it was a very big uh, blow to my aunt. And I felt it was in the middle of a lockdown in 2021, April 2021. And uh, there were restrictions in place for people to attend this funeral. And I cannot overstate the importance of uh, that man for uh, Austrian archaeology. Yet, uh, he was never the one to seek the limelight or to be exposed to the light that he actually deserved. You know, in academics, often people can be very um, compet competitive and um, push each other out of the way for their own careers. And that's very toxic. He was never one to endow those met methods. And so he was rather one that was frequently pushed aside un unjustifiably. And um, so I felt great rage also in, in myself to a degree when he passed away. And uh, there were on top of him not having always received the recognition that he deserved um, a lockdown in place that restricted the number of visitors to his funeral. So I thought, OK, I cannot let this this era of Austrian archaeology, just let, let it pass in silence and in a lockdown without sending a last 
big salute to this great man. So um, I was literally not prepared at all, neither physically nor mentally nor equipment wise for such an undertaking. But I just felt it in myself from one second to the other. I must do something to honor this person and to just take my gear and do a, a day's worth of marching. That's that wasn't appropriate. That didn't seem appropriate. It needed to be something unique. It needed to be something, a Herculean task to, to honor really this life. Anything else would have felt um, preposterous uh, to me. So I took three weeks, I think, two or three weeks of, of, of preparation in which I got, got all the bags that I needed, actually, and in which I re reformulated my ideas about um, how to carry the armor, how to carry my equipment, what to take with me on such a march, how to carry the shield. I mean, with a lot of... Um, data and experience reports from the Principate area, um, especially from people like Junkelmann and, and his followers that have done the transalpine marches and all these things. Uh, so with the rectangular shields and uh, earlier equipment, we, we kind of have a lot of experience, but no one has ever done something like that with the dominant era equipment. So fourth century equipment and most of the still visible infrastructure from Roman times on the Danube is exactly from the fourth century. All the big towers, the gates, the walls, the city walls that are still there from Roman times are post Diocletian. And so um, it felt to me that I, I needed to at least attempt to walk all the limes from Passau uh, to Gerolata near uh, Bratislava, or at least to the border. And um, yeah, so I took off. It wasn't prepared, it wasn't planned. I didn't have a press office to manage the press. I have one good friend, she's a renector as well, mainly in the Latin, but also in the Roman sector, Johanna Kufner. Shout out to her. She used to work in the press office of the president of Austria. And so she had excellent press contacts. And she just uh, a, couple, a day or two before I started walking, she sent out my press text to all the people that she still knew from that time. And um, that's how it all came about. Now, if I remember correctly, um, just a, a few uh, items. One of them was that Nova Roma um, gave you a grant to not yes. fully fund, but in part the um, the trip. And um, if I also recall correctly, um, didn't you hurt your foot or your leg on the journey, and therefore you had to get a cart to to complete the last stretch? Exactly. So, um, in fact, um, Nova Roma provided me with a, with a, with a grant, yes, with, a, um, with some support, financial support, um, which was brilliant because I literally destroyed my shoes on this walk. Um, the shoes were already two years old, so they were not new shoes. And I knew they would give up, give way um, on this trip. And um, so basically the, the money I got from Nova Roma were, was just... I got replacement shoes, so I, I got new shoes from, from that, and that was great. I used really high-quality shoes made by Meister Knirim, Stefan von der Heide in Germany. In my opinion, he's one of the best, uh, by far, uh, shoemakers specialized on Roman shoes. He uses only the best leather, best, like, nails for the sole. So you get a really authentic um, result from using those. Um, <clears throat> and they were, they were absolutely fantastic shoes. I, I didn't have a blister. Or anything um, but what happened to my foot so at about 200 kilometers um, on the march between the castrum of uh, Favianis which is now Mautan and the castrum of uh, Augustianis which is now Kreismauer it's about a 25 kilometer walk I walked in full armor and with my full gear I was accompanied by the first century legion the Ursi Aure, a young young group all young lads and, and lassies actually as well, young, young girls that are in full equipment with the armor. They walked with me. And on that day, I did about 30, 32 kilometers because we walked on to, to a stable so that we could... It was also the first day where the cart arrived. Some friends, Bert and Henrique from, from Bavaria with their horse Rufus. And um, they joined us on that day. And so we had to walk on beyond the castrum so that we could come to a, a literal Villa Rustica uh, to have the horse at the stables there and to sleep in the stables in the hay ourselves. 
So I don't know exactly what happened, but I had a bit of a pain in my foot already at the start of the day when we started walking. And um, at some point after a short break, I just stood up and it was as if uh, Jupiter himself uh, um, slammed a bolt, a thunderbolt into my foot. And it went from my foot directly to my head. And I felt, oh, something's broken now. Something's really wrong here. And um, so I limped on for the rest of the day, but my foot started to swell really badly. And I really had to limp um, and use my spear as a walking stick because I couldn't put pressure on my foot. It was extremely painful. And um, I certainly slowed down the entire thing. In the evening, there was also a thunderstorm coming and rain started dropping and a big storm uh, started brewing up. And during the night, uh, my foot really swole, swole up and I had shivers. I had a fever suddenly. And um, yeah, I thought the trip's over. I thought, okay, I'm about 100, 120, 150 kilometers away from, from my destination. And the trip's over because I, I can't walk on like this. I barely made it that day. And so we said, okay, well, we can either do that, give up and see what's wrong with the foot. Or we could do some real living history and say, well, stopping is not an option. I mean, injuries like that happen to soldiers in armies that would have to walk to war all the time. And just staying where you are is not an option. You have to continue. And so if there is a cart, then somehow with the cart, we'll make it. It's not walking as I had hoped but it is a, still a historic means of transportation. And by God, with the cart, it was even more adventurous than, than, I, than all the kilometers before where I was alone and on foot. Because on foot, you can go everywhere today. But on a horse-drawn carriage, our modern roads and infrastructures, they're just not thinking of that. They're just not made for that. You know, if you've got places that you just can't traverse or can't go from A to B with such with a horse. People just don't think of that. So we ran into um, choices like either you, we go on the highway, which is forbidden, or we have to go on a path which is constantly blocked or closed because they don't want bicycle riders there or they don't want uh, cars to drive there. And suddenly you, you, you find yourself having to break up some of the barriers or cut some holes into fences just to get through because there's not an option to stop. So we really experienced a clash between contemporary modernity and historic modes of transport. And we just wouldn't accept modernity's barriers. That's one of the most um, impressive experiences for me in, in that journey that we just said, look, it is a thousands and thousands of year old right of humanity to use nature's given historic means of transportation, which is walking and riding and driving with a horse-drawn cart. If we refuse, especially in today's day and age where we want to change um, our energy consumption, if we refuse to take cars or bicycles, we're almost screwed. So we said, no, nah, the people that designed those roads just didn't think that there would be people that would need to travel in that historic way. And that's why they closed them. We said, well, we don't accept this closure because it's not thoughtful. You need to still allow historic means of transportation. They need to have a place in today's world as well. But if everything breaks down our entire civilization, that's the only thing we still have that we revert to. And we can see that in the war zones, for example, where stuff gets broken and does break down. That's the things that will stay and we need to be able to, to use them at any moment. In Austria, could you go uh, on a horse-drawn carriage, for instance, on local roads? Or, I, I mean, uh, obviously, yeah, you, can. You, you have restrictions on, you know, larger roads that are more traveled. But, I mean, I'm not sure if, for instance, like a Bundesstrasse, which isn't quite a highway, but still a fast road, or local roads, you know, like what you're allowed to, to, to use and whatnot. Uh, you would be allowed to use those, of course, but um, there's dangers involved because not every horse is fine with, with walking on such a road. And um, also when you have a historic cart, <clears throat> you have to think it's still considered a, 
a car in, in a way and historic cards are just prone to breaking after a certain point you know modern cards don't necessarily have the same risk of losing a wheel or breaking and in fact in vienna because the horse got afraid um he backed up and bumped with the cart into one of those concrete um obstacles and uh, damaged one of the wheels and the wheel that led also to the fact that for after three days two and a half days that i was sitting on the cart we couldn't sit on the cart anymore because one of the wheels was so damaged that it started wobbling and it was only a matter of time till it would break off so from that moment on being on, on on roads with traffic was not an option for us either anymore we could still use the cart to transport our camp equipment i could put off my armor so that i would have less strain on my feet i was still carrying um my helmet and my weapons i let the shield on the cart i had my armor on the cart and also my other equipment on the cart but i was walking then from vienna on so from vienna to bratislava um i i was back on foot i had to be the cart wouldn't be able to to, to carry me anymore well i mean such a, an amazing experience um what happened at the end? Did, did you have like a very climatic finish of this trip or was it anticlimactic? Well, there's always, in every finish, there's both, I would say. In every finish, there's both. Um, it was certainly very climactic when we arrived at Carnuntum. Carnuntum kind of felt like the first end of the trip, although it's still a day and a half's walk away from, from Bratislava. Uh, it's quite close with a car, but like it's still a day away by walk from Gerolata. And um, but that's the station where Bert and Henrique and the horse uh, Rufus would leave me. That's where they uh, packed up everything and, um, and 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 packed their things and went back to Bavaria. So from from that day on, for the last leg of the journey, I was again uh, on foot and without the cart. And yeah, Karunup is kind of the spiritual home of, of lots of the things that I do and, and we do as a community of late antiquity. So it felt like when we walked through the arc of the triumphal arc that uh, probably Constantius II um, built there, um, it felt like that, that triumphal moment, that climactic moment of arrival and having made it, you know, from uh, Oyotro, from Passau to Karnuntum, that was uh, something I didn't think I would actually you know, I just did it. I, I jumped into it, but I didn't actively think I would be able to make it. Um, especially when the foot broke, uh, that seemed like it won't, won't happen. So that was a very emotional moment. The day after was very quiet. I had several people, uh, my girlfriend and a friend of hers, uh, and also a good friend from, from uh, my, my, my legion, from the Quarto de Kimani, uh, Hugo. He, he came also from, from Bratislava and walked with us. The day before, my other good friend from the Quarto de Kimani, Peter Hitzak, he walked with us. So we were a jolly group of friends. And my, my father also was waiting for us then at the border to pick us up and bring us home. But it didn't feel like, uh, like part of the trip anymore. It was a, a jolly last day. We walked. It was calm. We knew we made it. You know, we knew... It was done. We made it. It was just pleasant. And when we when we reached the border and the oppidum of Heinburg, where the uh, river Mach joins the river Danube, and on the other side you have Slovakia and also Gerulata, then uh, the camp of Gerulata. Uh, that's when we knew we made it. And it, it was it was very calm, very anticlimactic in a way. Just you know, get an ice cream, get into the car, drive back home as if. The last two weeks never happened. And if I have read correctly, you are also very into um, like living history, but also experimental archaeology. So this long trip is just one of many things that you've either done personally or set into motion. Um, can mm -hmm. you explain a few other projects that you've been involved in or or also things that you just learned um, while doing experimental archaeology. Well, I, I need to start with a slight correction. I, I'm actually not doing arch experimental archaeology at all. Um, experimental archaeology is a very precise field with a very precise definition, and everything I do does not fall into that category because experimental archaeology is experimental, and an experiment and a scientific, and a scientific definition 
has a specific question at the core of it and has a, a method of uh, um, falsification and correction and it is repeatable and um, that I'm, I never set up my things my, my things are experiential archaeology I wouldn't even say archaeology it's just experiential living history that's the correct term an experimental archaeology um, archaeologists uh, archaeologists always get very mad and rightly so when uh, reenactors use the term experimental archaeology for anything doing because it's not what reenactment is. Most reenactors don't either have the um, academic foundations or the gear or the actual experimental setup to actually conduct experimental archaeology. Just give you a brief example. For example, the, the Department for Ancient Textiles at the uh, Nature History Museum in, in Vienna uh, with uh, under Karina Grömer, they're doing experimental archaeology. They are taking a pig, they're dressing it in reconstructed textiles from the Latin or Ornenfeld period, for example, and they're burning it or burying it then. And then after a couple of years, they're opening this burial mound and then they're checking how the tex textiles are basically um, preserving themselves on or gluing themselves onto the bone or the flesh structure, etc. That, that's experimental archaeology. And it's all monitored somebody that's taking notes about everything data and it then ends in a publication and what i'm doing is nothing like that so okay. ju just just that also thank you so much for the clarification <laughs> it's it's a very important clarification because one of the big rifts between the academic community and the living history community is that the living history people suffer often from dunning kruger uh, syndrome i think they're much more knowledgeable or um, experience what they actually are and and often talk about experimental archaeology like absolute uh, laymen that have no idea what they're talking about. And of course, academics then get frustrated and say, well, with these clowns, why should we work with them? And that's also a false generalization because a lot and an increasing number of living history proponents on the top spectrum are very well versed in academic um, methodology, thinking and also in, in the procedures and do seek the connection with the academic community. And that's something that I'm very much trying to push because the one needs the other. We need to bring both together, education, research and recreation as in reenactment and living history need to work together because the one with, without the other is, is nothing. And, and what we sort of projects? have you been involved in uh, other than yes. this walk sorry yes i've completely on this tangent forgot your your um your uh, initial question i have been involved uh, just prior like to just two months uh, before um that trip in in another experiment or experience more so though this had a bit more experimental character because i was actually taking data and notes i was just not publishing anything after that uh, other than on facebook so I was wearing Roman armor um, for 12 hours a day um, for 40, it ended up being 19 days, but um, the initial setup was for two weeks, I'm going to wear full Roman armor for 12 hours a day. And I'm only going to eat the bare minimum rations that the Roman army would have had according to certain textual sources like Bucalatum, Lardo, Bosca, uh, and uh, what you can find from scavenging around and foraging, I mean, um, and take my and do some physical exercise, a lot of physical exercise. So either um, full body strength or endurance or walks or marches, patrols, stay up at night sometimes. So subject myself to quite a strenuous um, uh, regime every day while wearing the armor and then seeing how my body fat index changed, how my uh, weight changed, how my alertness levels and physical levels uh, just changed. And so I took. Uh, measurements every morning and every evening um, of, of all those uh, parameters. So my weight, my body mass index and body fat index. I noted exactly how many calories I would take, uh, take in every day by um, also publishing what I ate uh, and what calories it had. That was quite, um, quite impressive. I lost, I think, if I recall correctly, six kilograms in those two weeks. And uh, a lot of fat. I had my body fat uh, index reduced from. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but it was it was uh, definitely 
was a lot, a lot skinnier and leaner uh, at the end of the two weeks to the point that some um, publisher from New York actually contacted me and said, oh, he would be interested in publishing a, a weight loss book, The Roman Method, with me, <laughs> which, of course, I, I denied. <laughs> I said, no, nobody's going to buy a chain mail to lose some weight. There's enough other weight loss programs out there. Don't need another one that's pretending to be some legit historical thing when it's actually not. So, yeah. But it was funny that people thought that was a thing. Now there, and so, yeah, that was the bigger one. And I other than that, of course, it's mostly around fencing and uh, living in places like uh, reconstructed uh, buildings. And if I remember correctly, um, also last year, um, it wasn't Roman, it was post-Roman. Uh, you also tried to take a boat from, I believe, the French coast to the English coast. Exactly. That is uh, unfortunately still ongoing. Um, the Brioc, that's the name of the boat, after Saint-Brieuc, Saint uh, a Roman Britonic saint of the 5th century that uh, is uh, believed to be the founder of uh, Saint-Brieuc, the, the city in, 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 France, in, in Brittany. And so um, in the 80s or 90s, I think, the... the the city had a, one of those curragues reconstructed, so a leather boat from the 5th century uh, with which those uh, um, monks from the British Isles would uh, be sailing around and going from Ireland to Britain to the Shetlands to uh, Iceland even. Uh, and uh, if we believe the voyage of the, of, of the voyage of St. Brandon and even to the States, to America or, or, or wherever he went. And so they had one of those ships reconstructed and it wasn't a museum for a long time. And then uh, uh, reenactment associations, uh, the, the um, Sudardet, which is a, the Breton name for uh, the soldiers, uh, and uh, the Guarda Nod, which is the coast guards in Breton, uh, have taken on the ship and have propped it up again, repaired it, refurbished it, and um, actually made it more authentic by exchanging really, really every single detail that is modern on it, or that was a compromise. And their project is to sail from Brittany via the coast of Cornwall, up Wales, uh, up to Scotland and into Loch Ness, have the boat there over winter and sail back the next year. So that should have happened for the first time in 2021, but it got delayed to 2022. 2022, I finally uh, got the invitation to be part of the crew and to go over. So I went over and the ship wasn't ready yet. And then winds were not good and... If we hadn't sailed by the start of August, the the winds in Scotland wouldn't be feasible at that time for us. So with such a historic ship, so it ended up not having been ready. I had to go back to uh, Galicia actually to play some concerts with my 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 band with my folk band. And um, yeah, the ship never sailed last year, except for in Breton waters. And I was mainly part of the team. Uh, refurbishing the ship, making the new sails by hand, suing them, making new oars for the ship by hand. And I lived in Brittany, basically, just having two tunics with me, two hand-woven Roman tunics and a pair of sandals. Um, I lived for a month um, there and worked on the ship. It was a great experience. Sounds amazing. I, I want to jump in the chat. Because I'm very grateful for all the people that are contributing. Um, and uh, let me just read off a few of the message, uh, messages. Um, Tiberius Julius Nero wrote, Salve, mein Freund. And Flavia Procula wrote, I was trained as an archaeolog archaeologist too and an art historian. And I know how that is really a gateway drug, so to speak. I'm very sorry about your family friend. And also, you're so right about the average academic. Uh, atmosphere. It's very toxic. Uh, Lentilis joined the, the chat. He wrote Salve. Hortensia Faustina also wrote Salve. Um, and then L Lentilis wrote, uh, we are 12 Nova Roman citizens at the Conventus closing dinner. We send our greetings all waving. And uh, Hortensia Faustina waves too. So, I mean, um, I'm very glad that you were able to attend the Conventus for at least a few days. I mean, today is, today is the last day, but also um, you were there for the mo um, for very important days. And 
I also saw some pictures of you in the um, the museum there in Budapest. Uh, you, you mentioned that that's where it kicked off, but um, you really enjoyed the museum, right? I found it like a, a very world-class museum with excellent items there. Totally. Um, especially now for the Roman period and for, um, for, for late antiquity, it is one of the most astonishing museums I know it has such um, uh, treasury that, that that they have there. It just shows off the level of skill and craftsmanship and, and splendor that late antiquity still had to offer. Then, of course, the original of this very helmet sitting here next to me, that is the Budapest helmet, one of two such um, gem and uh, gold and stone ornated helmets that were found. One was found in Berkasovo in today's Serbia. And uh, the second one was found in the Danube, actually. Um, and uh, yeah, and the reconstruction of it is sitting here next to me. And it was always great to go and see the original there. Did you make that yourself? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I wouldn't have that level of skill. That was made by the Pustalak brothers. They're probably the most famous and renowned uh, helmet makers in all of Roman reenactment, be it for the Principate or for late antiquity. They have a special interest and a special passion for late antiquity. So that's what they started out as uh, to be famous for, to... They were the first ones to recreate this helmet, actually. I think this is the third or fourth uh, recreation of this helmet that exists in the world. This one is fully gilded. So the shine here is not just a very well polished um, uh, brass or bronze. And it's shine of gold. So it's the, like the original. The complete surface is golden. And um, yeah. It's very expertly crafted and, and and very, very close to the original. If you wouldn't mind, could you just pick it up and show it to the camera and maybe describe sure. a few elements of it? This is also probably my most expensive piece of kit. You can see it has a lot of detail everywhere. I'm almost afraid to touch it. Sometimes because I, I like the shine of the gold so much and I don't want to polish it too much because it is... Uh, I think galvanic gilding, so it does wear off if you polish it too often. Are those gemstones? They're glass stones, like the original as well. The original had glass stones inserted. Thank you so much. That that's absolutely amazing. And when you when that you wear it has it... an iron core that you can see inside. So the helmet is legit. It's it's iron on the inside, and it's just um, coated then with a gilded brass or bronze uh, sheeting or silver sheeting. It's all, mostly it's silver sheeting that's then gilded, fire gilded in historic times. Now, I, I remember seeing a picture in um, just back in April from the Natal de Roma. And there was another individual that you took pictures with. And I believe he has feathers on his helmet. So is that a different yeah, variation? Um, so the, the, other, the other emperor there at the Natal de Roma, that's uh, my good friend, uh, Marco Masencio. So Masencio, because he plays the Emperor Maxentius uh, from the start of the 4th century, the, of course, very famous from the Battle of the Milvian Bridge, where he succumbed to Constantine the Great. And um, the helmet that he's wearing is actually my old helmet. That was my first version of the Budapest helmet. I owned two of those. And the first one I had was not gilded. It was just covered with um, um, uh, brass sheets that were then highly polished to give the shine but it wasn't gilded. And so now I have the successor helmet. It's also a bit um, fitted a bit differently. So it hugs my face a bit better and um, it's gilded. And the I have a crest too. So normally you have a few buckles here and you can attach a crest and I have a, a peacock feather crest as well because peacock feathers were the uh, very likely the sole privilege of the emperor in, uh, in late antiquity. And that's why my friend as well is wearing a peacock feather crest. And I also know, notice on your tunic, um, you have some uh, designs on both sides. Uh, if I recall correctly, you did those yourselves. And I, I remember seeing pictures of you. Um, I, I'm not like sewing or what have you. And you mentioned that it took quite a long time. So are you, are you done with those elements? Well, actually, um, this tunic here, it's quite unique. Those, um, those decorations here are all woven 
in. So the whole thing, as you see it here, also those, they're not soon on. Those are the clavi, those are the orbiculi. And um, the whole tunic was also here. You can see this neck slit. It's not cut into the fabric. And then soon it's woven into the fabric like the original. So this tunic is unique in the world today. Um, for it has those woven in orbiculi. Now the camera doesn't have enough uh, um, uh, pixels to show you exactly the things, but uh, that's that's how the original tunics were made. They were woven in, in, in two or one pieces, and um, so that I couldn't do that myself. That was done by a hand weaver, a friend of mine in Germany, Circo Galtz, and he's uh, one of the most expert weavers out there. And I highly recommend every Renector to actually commission their tunics woven by hand by him because it's not that expensive anymore it's very affordable and it just is the real deal it's the real thing everything else that you just take and you sew and patch together it will be a costume it will be an approximation an optical interpretation and yes for many people that's good enough i know not everybody is into the real thing but i think one of the main motivations a good segue here to some other topics related to nova roma Nova Roma is all about being real and uh, creating realness out of reenactment in a way, be it ritualistic or institutional processes. It comes in many forms. So for me, really having real objects that are made in the same technique that are dyed with plants and that feel and, and, and touch and, and fall real is a very very big um of very big importance so to answer the other question uh, actually no i didn't do those this was done by my then girlfriend uh, daria uh, who really painstakingly wove those patterns into the fabric so it's really not just stitched but it's almost woven into it so that took a year to do and uh, I started doing it myself, but then she saw that my hands were not as meticulous and as uh, precise as hers. And she said, no, give that to me. Uh, you're just spoiling it. So I'm very, very, very grateful and thankful to her that she that she did that for me. As, as I said, it's a unique tunic. And to be honest, I almost I don't know what I prize more, this tunic or this helmet. Because ultimately, of this helmet, there's four in the world. Of this tunic, there's only one. Not to go into specifics, but you must have spent considerable time, money, and effort um, into your passion, into creating um, clothing or accessories or armor. I mean, ju just in terms of items, could you just briefly go through how many things that you created uh, by your own hand? Oh, we would we would be here for a long time if I went through everything. So I can, I, I will I will just give you some categories of. Um, I made some shoes. Uh, I made like most of my clothing, the ones that's not hand woven, so the, or where the fabric is hand woven but just as a sheet, and then I just cut it cut it out. So my tr trousers, uh, five or six pair of trousers, um, uh, a dozen of tunics. Um, belts of course my shields um covering the tegumen then painting of course of shields uh, impregnating uh, things a lot of repairs i've, I've uh, worked on my chain mail for ages I've, I've reshaped it i've made my other armors my squamata the scale armors Th those are all made by me and um, my father helped me as well and my friend peter hrizak uh, helped me to make the shape but uh, everything else, putting all the scales in place, I'm reshaping it every time because um, through my experiments, I often uh, go up and down in body weight, not so much in body fat, but like I have periods where I train excessively and I go to the gym and then everything gets a bit wider up here. Then you need to widen the armor. Then I have periods where I just don't have time for the gym and for eating and I get slimmer again. Then I need to tighten it. So it's a, a lot of work behind all of it. And then, of course, I use a lot of the things and they just get broken and you need to replace them or repair them. So mostly I'm repairing them. That's where most of the time is spent and repairing things. And did you make your own chain mail? Because I've actually seen chain mail being made at, in several different instances. And it looks like it takes thousands and thousands of hours. You would have to have so much patience to make, you know, a full 
Mm -hmm. I chainmail suit. I have started making a chainmail while I was still in school um, many years ago. And exactly what you said, I found it out then. I was like, yeah, I could either spend a thousand hours here now making this or pay other people <laughs> considerable sums of money to do for me. And so I decided to earn money and with something that I'm better at and more where I, I'm, I'm proved more useful than spend it on people that make the chain mill for me. You can get chain mills at quite reasonable prices today already. Most of them are made in India, but you have actually very dedicated and, and talented craftsmen that make chain mills of absolute superior quality in Russia or in Poland as well. So um, always recommend the European craftsmen over the Indian ones for certain things like chain mills, like armor, because it will be a little bit more expensive or a lot more expensive, but it will be more real, more authentic, more qualitative, and it will hold much longer. So in the end, it's cheaper because you don't buy twice or three times. You buy once and it, it'll hold. So there's actually a lot of topics I still need to get into, and we only have about half an hour. So oh, wow. let me... Okay. Let, let me uh, shoot off a few quicker questions before we move on to some more fun parts of, or other fun parts as well. Um, yeah. One question is, uh, how did you specifically get into reenacting and what was your very first experience? Okay, I'll try to answer it quickly. Um, I got into it via fantasy, the fantasy genre, I would say. So I, I, when I was nine years old, I watched the movie Dragonheart with a then boyfriend of my aunt, who is a Welshman and an archaeologist. So he had a proclivity to like dragons and dragged me into the cinema and we watched that movie. And uh, then I just wanted to be a knight. And so I fell into the whole King Arthur thing. I really read everything about King Arthur and the round table. And then at some point, when you're trying to research the historic truth behind it or the, the historic era, you, you find the late Roman Empire, and you find people like Constantine the Great or Valentinian or Julian the Apostate, and you find out that, oh, well, those people are actually real, and they're even much, much cooler than King Arthur, and they're real life people that you can prove and, and see what they did. So then I became a huge fan of Constantine the Great and started doing everything in, 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 in to do some late Roman reenactment. Also, because I'm, I'm close to Carnuntum, I live. Uh, an hour away from Carnuntum, and it's uh, building reconstructions from the early fourth century there. So uh, it just made total sense to 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 get into that. And, and your very first experience? My very first, I couldn't say my very first experience really because it slowly morphed into as a child already dressing up, and my my dressing up got more and more elaborate and more and more authentic ish in a way. And the, so I, I was a reenactor bit by bit, I would say. Probably the first thing was when I joined a, a, a Latin a B Celtic reenactment group here in Austria, the Bowie Pannonia, which I'm still a, a part of. And then we're really good friends. I'm just not spending much time on, on Celtic reenactment anymore. And um, they, they brought me really into the whole thing um, on, on, a, on, a, on a higher level. So... And it was a, a small private event. We just gathered somewhere and had a little camp and and, and exchanged on on reenactment things. And uh, so it wasn't something grand. In late Roman or in Roman reenactment terms, it was something very grand. It was in 2013 when I joined the um, big uh, event in Marle in France in the Merovingian uh, Museum there. There was about 500 reenactors and we staged a battle between Roman late Roman forces and the Germanic forces. And I was, uh, that was my first event as a, as a late Roman. And you've actually had the distinction of founding your own festival. Well, not your own specifically, but you are the founder of the late Roman festival in Carnuntum. How does one found their own festival? Uh, to be honest, just the same way as I started this March. It was a moment. It revealed itself to be a good idea, and I just did it. Um, so the story of the late the festival of late antiquity in Carnuntum, it starts at my first reenactment experience as a late Roman in Marl in 2013. Um, there, because I speak several languages and I was also 
rather proficient in fencing. And I was actually the only Roman that won the duels on that day. All the other Romans got killed by the barbarians. I, I got into a prominent position, lucky enough, uh, uh, quite quickly. So um, th this festival in Marl, it happens every two years. So in 2015, it happened again. And so it means I had two years time in between to really upgrade my equipment and to also brush up on my fencing skills. So in 2015, I came back and I was asked to be the personal protector and uh, commander of the central ala of the Roman army on the battlefield. Uh, so this personal protector of the, the commander of the Roman army, a good friend of mine, Benjamin Francard, an excellent reenactor. So I was again the only Roman that won the duels on, on both days, Saturday and Sunday. And um, then in quite a spectacular fashion, the man I was beating was much more muscly, much heavier than me and had much more battle experience than me. So I think that that uh, Hollywood-esque um, entry be something they wanted to see. You know, I had the right age. I had the right speech, I had, I had the right equipment and I was the right guy at the right time to get the trust of literally the entire scene that was present there. And they said, well, this is so great here, but we would love one day if we could do a specifically late Roman event at Carnuntum because it's the only place in the world where you have those buildings from the fourth century so faithfully reconstructed and where you can do really live that time in a way. and. They all spoke of it as if it was a purely hypothetical possibility in, other, in another universe and it'll never happen because it's too difficult to do. And I just said, well, let's do it next year. And everybody was uh, almost laughing at me and saying, oh, you're, you're very naive. You're very enthusiastic, but um, that would be a dream, but it'll never happen. And eight months later, it happened. I just made a Facebook group asked all the late Roman reenactors of good quality that I knew, would you be willing to come if the museum only pays you what you need to come? So the travel expenses, but no additional money. Because it will not be a no because the museum doesn't want it. It'll be a no because the museum doesn't have the money for it. So if money is not the problem, will you come? And everybody said, yes, we will come. So, okay, on this promise, I go now to the director of the museum and I tell him I will give him an additional festival on a silver tablet. That's literally the words I used. I said to the director, I can give you a high quality, late antiquity only festival that will be unique in the world. And I give it to you on a silver tablet because we don't need more than 6,000 euros for it. And he said, well, 6,000 euros, that's, that's nothing. Here, have it. Let's do it. Let's try it. So I'm very thankful for the openness of the director, of uh, Markus Wachter. And literally eight months after the idea was first conceived at Marl, we just did it. And it was a, a huge uh, success. And it, it was a huge success ever since. Absolutely amazing. I mean, I'm very fascinated when people really take the initiative in um, ancient Roman items like that. And also, um, we're going to get into a, a big initiative that you've taken in just a moment. Um, Tiberius Julius Nerva just wrote in the chat, um, what are your plans for the future, for the, for the near and also for the for the far future? Just in, in terms of reenacting? Oh, that's also or... a topic to ask. So very brief answer. Um, I want to stabilize and even expand the Festival of Late Antiquity in Carnuntum, but I want to also expand Late Antiquity festivals throughout Europe. So um, I want to create more legions. I've started to create legions um, mainly throughout Eastern Europe via EU projects like Living Danube Blemis, etc. Um, or to create them, to help people that have already uh, a leaning towards late Roman reenactment or help people find late Roman reenactment and then integrate them. So uh, I use the sentence, I levy legions left and right. So I want to levy more legions also outside of Europe. We're now um, doing that in the United States, but also especially in Northern Africa and in the Levant, because that is part of the Roman sphere. Rome is not just Europe. We're often forgetting that. So we have uh, great plans for uh, countries like Egypt, like Tunisia, Morocco, uh, Algeria, uh, Lebanon, of course, Syria as well. We want to find people there that want to celebrate their Roman heritage together with us. And we want to expand on those places, Turkey as well, of course. And I want to create a consistorium um, so that is an administ administration for the late Roman scene that is uh, 
basically should be the bl blueprint for how to organize the late Roman Empire in the of reenactment in the future. And I want to be more active in Nova Roma in terms of shaping what it can become and be as an institutional body or a, a, as an institution that houses institutional bodies. Um, for example, like a, a quality certification for different reenactment levels as a service, not as a prerequisite, but if a group, for example, wants to get a Nova Roman certification of quality, and there's different levels of, of quality that can be certified, then a group can come and can get that. And to work on having this sort of certification curr curriculum also recognized by academic institutions or by clients of reenacting groups like municipalities or museums so that they can reference to Nova Roma, for example, for a really guided quality certification on the groups that they're hiring, because we do have a massive problem with inaccuracies and um, reenactorisms in the living history community. And uh, this problem needs to be addressed. And I think Nova Roma can be that tool that was missing so far to address that. And in the, the near future, uh, what sort of events and items do you have on the agenda uh, for this year, for instance? Uh, this year, um, I'm mainly occupied, of course, with the uh, setting up of my company that produces the Posca, Legio Posca. So um, we are we're present at uh, several events almost uh, every weekend now. Uh, next weekend, there's the gladiatorial games in Carnuntum. Then we are also present in Italy at the Romans Langobadorum, the 6th century late antiquity festival. We're also present in other festivals in Germany, in Bulgaria, in Austria, of course, in Hungary, uh, Slovenia, uh, Slovakia. Um, and then hopefully also in France and um, we're working also on all the other countries and so mainly I'm there to to promote of course uh, the drink because this drink should become a financial tool for everything Roman and archaeology something like a Red Bull but for us living history and history fans and enthusiasts and for archaeology definitely and since the segue was made let me show the audience what I have here. So two cans of uh, Posca. I do have to say that I love the coloring. It, it's, a, it's a very dark, deep red, and um, the tops are almost scold. Not quite, but almost. And um, it, it's amazing to look at. So it says SPQR, and then you have Legio. Uh, and then you also have the uh, she-wolf with uh, Remus and Romulus. So it, it's a very appealing um, uh, can. And you could tell that you put in a lot of effort to make this. I mean, obviously, um, for it to be sold, I mean, you have to go beyond just having a concept, but you also have to you know, have the facilities and the permissions to do everything. So could you quickly um, just go through the steps of how you originally got the idea to having a like a prototype and testing to how you got to the position where you are today, where you actually sell this at uh, different events. Well, oh, another hard question. Uh, uh, so basically, I, I, I started drinking Posca and making Posca during this um, 14 to 19 days uh, experiment uh, with the armor, where I was wearing the armor 12 hours a day, because uh, that's what was written in the sources. The soldiers drink vinegar, Posca, for two days, and on the third day, they get a ration of wine. So I was doing that. I was following that. And uh, so I looked up several YouTube channels and uh, PDFs and, 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 and websites that were talking about how to make Posca. And there's recipes about how to make Posca online. And I followed them, and the thing was undrinkable. Literally, it was disgusting. Uh, and then I, I researched some more and I said, where do these measurement units for the Posca come from? Literally, they come out of thin air. There is absolutely no historic record of how the proportions of the Posca mix are. Those were made up by people in the 20th century. And everybody treats those measurements as if they are given to us by Apicius himself, which is absolutely not true. We know what is in a Posca. We know that it can be different things. We know that the main component is, of course, water and vinegar, but we don't know in which proportions to mix it. So I started mixing it so that it actually tastes good. 
because that's that was the thing I was going to drink after really hard days for the rest of uh, for the better, better time of two two weeks. So it better be tasting good. And I take it on with me on marches and I, I really, it needs to not make me gag. It needs to be good. And I think it was the most popular non-alcoholic drink in antiquity in Rome. It must have had something to it. And the, the versions that are out there, the, the recipes, they just are horrible. So I fi- eventually found out um, several recipes that, that really tasted well. And after that whole experiment, I never thought about commercializing it because I thought, well, it tastes well to me. I got used to it, but still it's not a product for the wide market because it has vinegar inside and it's, it is an intense taste. This is the really purely historic form. But one day, because I got so used to the taste of Posca, and it's really an interesting taste, I, I said to myself, long after I had done my marches and everything, um, well, not long, but like after I'd done the march, um, I'll try to mix it for me again, just because I didn't have anything else to drink. And I found I had no honey in the house. There was just a jar with agave syrup as a sweetener. So I, I used the agave syrup. I used a special type of vinegar that I just found um, the other day before biological one and then I put the whole thing into the soda stream to add some uh, CO2 and um, the result tasted amazingly good and I I thought wow this is a Posca that I could actually that could be appealing to 21st century people and that's when the idea immediately came to me this needs to be commercialized because it has an it's a good drink it's actually a good drink it's healthy it's super simple there's no stabilizers and emulators and whatnot in, in it. It's just really four ingredients. And it has one of the most powerful background stories of any drink, more powerful than Coca-Cola. So, like, I didn't have to invent anything. I didn't have to come up with a clever marketing strategy. Rome has done all that for me. Even the can. Everybody is congratulating us on the can design. And I say, don't congratulate us. Congratulate the Romans because we didn't do anything there. Just use Roman iconography, Roman language of power, of symbols. That's all. Rome is selling this can, not me. So, yeah, that's that's how it came about. And I, I, I had to obviously find the money because it's not cheap to, to make these things. I had to find out a lot of, of things about uh, safety regulations for foods, all the laws. I mean, I'm not born as a, as a drink manufacturer at all. So I had to familiarize myself with all of that. I had two friends, one friend uh, from school, Patrick Mauer, and uh, my cousin, Tobias. Uh, we were, we're the same age. We were born all, almost at the same time. And we're always best friends. So uh, I, I convinced the two of that. The two of them are absolutely not into Roman history or into Rome. That's not their thing. But when I gave them a first presentation and pitch about the idea, they were immediately on board. They said that this could really work. And um, gladly, they have more money than me. So uh, we could start a company and start with the first production. So we produced, uh, after one year of research, of um, uh, experimenting and of testing, and we had a small test series of 1,000 cans that we could produce. Those are the prototypes. Um, So after one year, after founding the company in 2021, uh, we could produce a series of cans, which is the one in your hand now. And now we're trying to sell those in the museum shops or festivals via our soon-to-be-launched web shop. And especially in order to get some grants from the banks so that we can then produce larger series of 130 to 300,000 cans. So that's the really hard period now where we need to kick off everything at the same time into gear, which is, uh, to be honest, excruciating uh, it's just too many things to do. And we're just two people working in the company. And at the moment, it's mostly me working in it. And I have to be a musician. I'm also an officer. I have to go to events. I have to prepare the events. Then after coming back from the events, also clean everything. I have to still do my reenactment things and and, and forward that. I have just too many things to do. And I hope we survive this period. Just out of curiosity, was it easy to find like a bottling facility that would actually produce this on an industri- industrial scale for you? Or was that a challenge in of itself to see, you know, who could, you know, you could partner with? That's the biggest challenge we're facing right now. Um, something that nobody told us is that, again, 
we face a conflict between history and modernity again, like with the horse-drawn carriage. Nobody today drinks soft drinks with vinegar. So because vinegar leaves an aftertaste ever so slightly on the machines, in especially the, the plastic tubes where, where it goes, nobody wants to fill vinegar on a drink um, machine. So normally Coca-Cola, Sprite, all these things that are non-alcoholic, they are bottled and, and, and canned on, on a machine. Beer is canned in a different factory and it's only beer and alcoholic beverages that are canned there. And vinegar is only canned where vinegar is canned. So if you bring the vinegar now into the soft drink, non-alcoholic bottling and, and canning factory, they will tell you no. And they don't need to. There's so much demand that every single factory is completely booked out. So they, they can easily reject you. And, and, and so most people do. Most people actually tell us, look, uh, of course, it's possible to, to, to make your drink with the vinegar, but it's an ever so slight effort to clean it a little bit better after we did your series that we just say no. So now we're really looking uh, very hectically entering um, with people that see the potential in this drink and that can see that um, this, this could go very, very big because it tastes really good and it has just such a powerful story that people will, will lash onto it, even people that know Rome. Well, ever since I saw a Facebook teaser about it a few months ago, I've been waiting really in anticipation for this moment. So I had not had it before. And I do thank you so much for uh, sending me these uh, two cans. Um, and let's give it a try. I mean, you, you can notice the, the vinegar just, uh, just smelling it. Yep. But then take a second smell after the first one and you won't. And most people say they don't taste the vinegar actually that much when, when they're actually drinking it. It's more of a fruity and sweet taste. Absolutely true. I do have to say that you, you smell the vinegar, you taste it for a second, and then uh, absolutely. So you mentioned that um, you have agave in there, and it actually is a very smooth finish. I was thinking that it, it would have had a more of a kick to it, but I guess um, you didn't use that much vinegar, and obviously the agave smoothens out the sharpness of the vinegar. So it's actually really good. That's it, yeah. Very nice. And then you also have all the information, I believe, in German and Hungarian and a few other languages to make it very international. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> well, you have to, you have to, it's the, the big difficulty is you have to put the languages of the countries that you want to sell it in onto it. And that's not the only thing. So we had to pick a few languages, a few countries. So we have France, Italy, Austria, Hungary that are the main um, places where we want to start selling this series or where we can sell this series. We can't sell this Now, on uh, my screen, uh, unfortunately, I could hear you, but your your video cut out. But um, I, like I said, I could still hear you. So let's continue, and hopefully, your your video will pop back up. Um, we don't have that much. Uh, I, I could hear you, but I just don't see you. So I, it happens sometimes, you know, with connection issues, or also with uh twitch because we are live streaming so um it happens sometimes now uh tiberius julius nerva just wrote in the ch chat 
Uh, for me, Posca is like a Sprite, but much, much better. And that's actually a very valid uh, comparison to Sprite. Absolutely. Um, now, there are some mentions in the chat that unfortunately your audio also dropped on on the Twitch side, although I could hear your audio just fine. Um, so uh, he, Stilicka was just talking about, you know, the vinegar and um, the comparisons to Sprite and what have you. Um, unfortunately, it does happen sometimes, you know, when you're live streaming. Um, it's very unfortunate, but we are also about to wrap up in the next few minutes. So I only have two questions for him anyways. Uh, hopefully the next, or hopefully, you know, his his stream will Im improve so you guys could hear him, see him as well. Um, but if not, uh, then I'll just uh, summarize his answers and then we could just wrap up then. Um, one of the questions I, I had is, um, when do you expect Posca to be sold in for instance, the US or in Asia or Australia? Or is that right now not on the cards? Sure. Sure. For for the people in the chat who unfortunately might not be able to hear him, he says that it could take some time for um, Posca to be sold outside the EU. Obviously, there are various challenges um, to do so, and right now the the setup with two people it just um, it's just not possible right now. Obviously, they would like to do in the future. But um, there's just no time commitments at at this time as to as to when it could potentially be sold outside the EU. Um, thank you so much. I have one last question, um, and that actually has to do with a bit what you were mentioning before. I know that you can uh, place all sorts of uh, instruments, and you're a professional musician. I'm wondering if uh, you actually play some Roman instruments, and if you ever played some Roman uh, instruments publicly as part of a so reenactment.
Definitely. Um, for for those in the chat, in case um, you weren't able to hear due to technical difficulties, uh, he was just saying that uh, although uh, music is his passion and also his profession, um, he he does have a few Greek instruments, but he doesn't play them during festivals because that's just not what um, his character or role is. Obviously, you know, an emperor or someone else wouldn't just be playing the playing the flute so i mean he he plays it on, on a personal in, in a yeah just in, in, a, in a private uh, matter but n nothing for public or for research um well that was the very last question that i had for you um i have to say i thank you so much for uh being a part of this interview um i definitely hope that uh, the the connection improved at the end there. And um, I've had so much fun. It's been fascinating speaking with you. I mean, for about two years, I've followed you uh, on uh, Facebook and seeing all your adventures. So it, it's definitely nice to finally interact with you and hear your voice. <laughs> Absolutely. I also want to thank everybody in the chat and all the people that have been watching this live. We're definitely going to um, uh, make this available for people that uh, watch it in the future, because obviously not everybody could uh, make the time right now to watch it live, including, for instance, um, in Europe, it's dinner time and they, they have the final dinner at Conventus, uh, at the Conventus, which um, this uh, stream is uh partially dedicated to also the uh the current ludi at at this time so so thank you so much thank you for the um just for your attention and your time both you personally uh Stilicchio, and also for the 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 audience at home and i hope everybody has a great day and definitely um check this out i believe uh the social media sites have just uh, come online so people could read more about it. And with that, I have to say uh, uh, salvete to all of you. H have a great day.